<clears throat> okay, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, we're going to talk about both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So the picture, I think, does a nice job describing the differences. Crohn's is a disease that can really occur anywhere in the GI tract, mouth to anus. Like, you can have any type of involvement. There are certain areas that are much more common. Ulcerative colitis is the uh, large bowel and the rectum only. So you aren't going to see that in the small intestine. So I'll start with Crohn's. <clears throat> so um, this is going to sound a lot like rheumatoid arthritis because it's an autoimmune disease. So very similar treatment strategy here. Um, so when we look at psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and Crohn's, we're, we're really using a lot of the same medications. So you can kind of keep those all in one pool. They're all autoimmune, and we approach them very similarly. Uh, so to talk about Crohn's, where we're looking at it, and, and this can depend on how you treat patients too. So um, Crohn's can have uh, effect all over the bowel, but primarily a lot of your patients are just going to have small bowel involvement only. They aren't going to have anything <laughs> else. So the small intestine is going to be their, their primary site. Now you can look at all these other ones where 50% of patients, still probably the majority of people you'd see, or slightly uh, over or under, are going to be small and, small and large bowel involvement as well, and then you have uh, lower amounts of patients who are going to be the various other parts of the GI tract. Um, not really certain about the etiology of what causes Crohn's. I think it's kind of interesting. There's thought to be a genetic component, but that hasn't been fully proven either. Uh, okay, so local symptoms. These are the symptoms and how you might d decide if somebody's got severe Crohn's versus not. Usually a flare it involves significant diarrhea like several, several times a day, and uh, bleeding is, is common. Minimal bleeding is quite common with, with any type of Crohn's flare, whether it's minor or not. Um, and then if somebody has severe colitis, that's where you might see really uh, large amounts of blood passing. So uh, those are the things we might look at and use as diagnostic criteria for how well our medication regimens are working. So if somebody is not having as much diarrhea or if their bleeding is all, that would be controlled, right? So the cramping and everything is likely going to come alongside of the diarrhea. That's what's causing it. So fistulas is another really bad complication that can happen with Crohn's and often lead people potentially to surgical solutions, and that would be uh, communication between two epithelial lining <coughs> organs. So sometimes within the GI tract, if you get a fistula, so if you get a fistula in the small intestine um, where there's not supposed to be one, that might not be that big of a deal because it's going to pass through there anyway. Um, not that it's not a problem, it could be, but it's much worse if you think about like a fistula between something like the rectum and, for example, a young female or any type of female having a vaginal fistula, so that can actually happen too, um, and that would require really substantial surgery. So there's um, lots of complications that can arise from fistulas, and you can get other organs involved in fistulations too. So for example, if you have bowel near the kidneys that ends up getting some sort of a fistula near there, and again, you can get a septic picture really quickly if you get a, a peritoneal infection. So there's a lot of problems with um, the different types of Crohn's, and depending on where it is, but um, uh, between the diarrhea, the bleeding, and the fistulas, there, this can be a really big quality of life issue for a lot of patients. So we can approach this from a drug standpoint. Obviously, there's other things you can do as well, and there's surgical solutions that ultimately may be the best for a patient, like follow resection. But uh, we'll talk about drugs here first. So um, complications systemically. So we talked about the, the GI-related things. However, you can get a lot of interesting systemic complications with Crohn's. The reason I say interesting is you think about it as a, as a GI illness, but really with an autoimmune disease, you do get some really similar complications as you would see in um, things like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, eye involvement, skin involvement, like even like you'd see psoriasis. So again, I say that keep these those three diseases all in sort of the same mask because they're all treated similar and they actually all have well, they all have some very hallmark symptoms associated with them. They all have some similar systemic complications that you'll see with each one. Okay, so choosing therapy, you're going to look at your disease severity, anatomic location, and your goal. Are you trying to induce or maintain remission? Or are you, so that would be the big question. Is this a new Crohn's patient? Is this a flare you're trying to treat? Or is this patient doing okay and you just want to keep them out of, out of uh, another flare from occurring? And these are going to be the things that are going to lead you towards severity. So more numbers of stools, higher bleeding, systemic complications would all increase severity that way. So the reason I'm talking about this stuff, getting out of my comfort zone a little bit, and talking about diagnostic stuff, is because it's important when we look at the drugs. So historically, Crohn's has been designed as a um, 
start at the bottom of the pyramid and work your way up to your investigational or your, uh, not investigational, but your um, biologic medication. So things like infliximab or um, uh, other, we'll talk about a few other biologic agents too. And then uh, historically, we started with things like, uh, we'll talk about these amino salicylate drugs, 5-ASA drugs. Some antibiotics can have positive effects for Crohn's patients, and uh, there's some alternative therapies too. But uh, this is sort of flipped, I think, for a lot of rheumatologists recently on its head where they're saying, you know, this is a severe disease with a lot of complications. We're not going to mess around with these therapies at the bottom of the pyramid that honestly just don't work that well. Let's go straight to, to a bigger gun right off the bat get somebody into Crohn's remission right away. Um, they can take it regularly, and they're having really good outcomes with that strategy, too. So with that in mind, you have two different schools of thought, and it depends on probably the practice you work in. Uh, but I think that starting at the top of the pyramid is actually getting more popular. But we'll talk about it both ways. So the step-up approach is to start with your uh, more limited therapies and your less effective therapies and work your way up that pyramid. <laughs> Top down would be to start with a biologic or some sort of immune modulating therapy right off the bat and then work your way and adding more stuff if you need to. So again, there's some different things, different theories here. I think the idea is that the top down is just going to get you into remission faster, have fewer side effects overall. There's a lot less trial and error for the patient to go through. So <laughs> I think your patient's going to benefit tremendously from a strategy like that. The problem is it's really expensive. So obviously our biologics, their biggest barrier is cost in most cases. So if we have a patient who's new Crohn's and we say, okay, we want to start them on Humira, well, insurance says, oh, they haven't tried anything else. Or have they tried a 5-ASA drug or some of these cheaper, older therapies? No, they haven't. Well, why don't you try that and then come back to me? So again, that kind of dictate how you, how you treat it. But with a, a disease like Crohn's can have some potentially pretty significant septic complications, surgical related complications that are expensive. Um, the idea of giving somebody an expensive medication right off the bat, I think is getting a, to become a much more accepted practice where we can keep patients out of the hospital and keep them healthy. It's going to work really well for everybody, our patients and our, our healthcare systems. So um, again, you're seeing a shift in trend as these biologic therapies gets more, more um, accepted. And that's not Crohn's alone. We talked about that with RA and psoriasis, where you're seeing that becoming more and more common. But um, let's talk about these older drugs historically, because they are still do still have some functionality and use potentially, um, especially with ulcerative colitis, which we'll get to. But um, 5-ASA drugs are amino salicylates. So they're kind of like aspirin analogs. Um, we think of them maybe as a local NSAID. So they're probably decreasing inflammatory response and modulating how the immune system's responding within the GI tract. 5-ASA drugs theoretically don't absorb or have any systemic complications, although we talked about these with respect to rheumatoid arthritis. So how do they work there? Again, no one knows. They aren't really supposed to get outside the GI tract. In fact, they're really only useful in the large bowel. Um, for the most of these drugs, they require specific GI flora to cleave them into the active component. And if they aren't getting that process happening, which usually doesn't happen in the small intestine, they aren't going to be effective. So really, we have to get them to the large intestine. There they can work. So if you have a Crohn's patient with small bowel involvement, which again, 80% of your patients likely to have that, um, or at least a large majority of them, this makes this drug look even less important for Crohn's. And it really isn't an important Crohn's treatment. I just bring it up because technically it could be used, and originally it was developed for that. Ulcerative colitis, which we'll talk about in a, in a few slides, still has some, some good um, evidence for using these medications because it's um, it's uh, specific to the large bowel, but for this particular uh, instance, not really all that important. Um, so we'll talk about these more with UC, but I'm going to skip the rest of them. Um, other than just to say there's a couple different products out there, uh, and um, they all are dosed a little bit differently. So here's all the different ones. Um, sulfasalazine was originally the first one out there, and then the salamine came out. Um, you aren't really going to see anything used other than mesalamine products. And there's a ton of different mesalamine brand names out there. Basically, they're all just different controlled or extended release formulations. So when these first came out, they were four times a day dosed, and people are taking basically fistfuls of them throughout the course of the day. Now some of the more advanced medications like, uh, ooh, where is, uh, like Lealda and Asacol, uh, some of them are once daily. Uh, so you're getting a much more extended release property there that um, delays even absorption and release or, or release until you get to the colon and then it releases at the site of action specifically.
So there's some cool pharmacology with some of these medications, but some of them are kind of expensive. Other ones have been around for quite a while and are quite cheap. So you get kind of all across the spectrum with the 5-ASA drugs. But and we'll come back to them during, during your UC and talk about where they're a little bit more clinically relevant. This just shows um, some of the different uh, extended release and how they work and how long they last. So in case you're wondering how many times a day you have to take them this year. So anyway, not a huge role in uh, these specific indications. So again, I'm going to cut through some of this because it's just really not worth talking about. Um, so if you have a patient who uh, is Crohn's with mild to moderate active disease, what we're going to do is manage them usually with outpatient and oral therapy. So um, again, this is talking about the step up approach. This is a more conservative strategy. Um, so if somebody has active disease, location-wise, it's going to depend on how you decide to treat them. So again, colitis, for somebody with mild disease, you could consider a 5-ASA drug. But steroids actually have some, uh, some roles, too. And we can even use gastric acid suppression to prevent complications such as ulcerations and damage to the, uh, the mucosa. Antibiotic therapy um, historically was used for patients who don't tolerate the 5-ASA agents <laughs> or would, were on them for like a month and didn't improve. So a lot of patients would end up on antibiotic therapy. Um, for chronic Crohn's disease, um, metronidazole alone was a medication that has been shown to work decently. Um, the problem with giving somebody antibiotics for a chronic illness is antibiotics were never really studied for use in chronic situations when they were originally approved. So if metronidazole, if you take a seven-day course of it for, you know, whatever it might be, uh, infectious disease related, you're not going to really see any side effects with it beyond some of the immediate things. If you give it over several months, you can actually get some permanent peripheral neuropathies in some cases. It's rare, but it's still something that's seen. So not the most safe thing to do. And, I'll, and that's not even touching on antibiotic resistance or things like that. Um, ciprofloxacin is another one that's been studied in Crohn's for chronic use as well. Um, for fistulizing Crohn's or for Crohn's that doesn't involve the colon, you might see um, Cipro used alone. Remember, metronidazole is a anaerobic agent, so it covers our anaerobic pathogens. And what you're seeing here is really two drugs used to prevent uh, overgrowth of my microbes that could cause uh, increases in infection rates. If you're having some sort of a uh, inflammatory response, you could possibly be looking at risk for a septic picture or, or any type of ulceration that's risk for a septic picture. So that's the idea with these drugs. They aren't really helping the disease itself. So that's why I'm kind of hesitant to even talk about this all that much because it's really not, I don't think, an appropriate way to approach treating Crohn's chronically. However, it is an option and there is some older evidence that supports using these and that if you can suppress Crohn's flares with, uh, with an antibiotic strategy. Duration with antibiotic use, because that's the big question, um, that there's a lot of uh, variable evidence that supports using it for one month or six months. There's just not a good consensus out there, which makes it even more confusing to try and prescribe antibiotic therapy. Steroids. Uh, steroids actually have a decent role, um, especially in flares. So if you give somebody systemic steroids during a Crohn's flare, you can really suppress the immune response, just like you would any type of immune-related um, uh, flare of some sort of an illness, and steroids are no different for Crohn's use. Prednisone, 40 to 60 milligrams a day can be helpful in this situation. You can also use budesonide. Uh, if you remember Pulmacort, the brand name from the uh, respiratory lecture, that's budesonide. It's an inhaled corticosteroid. It comes as a nebulized solution, and so somebody at one point started giving their patients this and having them drink it, and it actually was shown to be okay um, and get a decent response. And the nice thing is it doesn't absorb systemically out of the GI tract, so you don't get the systemic side effects you would get from prednisone. So chronically, you could actually consider budesonide as an option for these patients for chronic local infl inflammatory suppression. Now, you might get a little bit of systemic side effects if you use them enough, because some of it probably absorbs, but compared to prednisone, it's much, much less. Um, a product that came out recently is a capsule called Eucerus, which is a brand name product that's, that's, that's budesonide, and it's specifically designed for this indication. Um, so the question is, do you use one or the other? Well, the nebulizer solution is probably a lot cheaper, so some patients might do that, but the, the capsule is designed to specifically release in a way that, that covers the whole GI tract, so it might be more of an effective approach. It just depends on what the patient can afford, I think. Anyway, um, good option for people who are intolerant or contraindications to systemic steroids.
So again, talking about mild disease, mild active Crohn's disease, looking at our maintenance options. Um, once somebody gets remission, if, they get, if you're able to get somebody in remission using 5-ASA drugs, steroids, and uh, or, or antibiotics, your choices then are usually looking at a 5-ASA drug long-term for maintenance. So if that actually worked for somebody, that's what you might see done to prevent somebody from getting another flare. Again, this isn't really common in Crohn's because most patients wouldn't qualify for that type of a treatment anyway, but it is an option. Bunesonide can be used for about three to six months, and not because you can uh, you get side effects after that. It just doesn't work quite as well once you use it uh, regularly. Um, and no treatment. So if somebody has mild Crohn's and they <coughs> solve the flare and they don't have any other symptoms, there's some evidence that shows that not treating the patient at all after that is a reasonable response. So anyway, a kind of older school way to approach things. And here's a, a chart that shows a little bit of how you might do the step up approach traditionally for a Crohn's patient. So five ASA drug. Um, if you aren't getting a response, go to antibiotics. No response to that, you would try steroids. So again, in real life, is this done? It really depends on the patient, how severe their Crohn's is, and where their Crohn's is located. And that's really the big questions you have to ask. For the majority of Crohn's patients, this is not going to work for them. And we're going to end up with immunosuppressive drugs or hospitalizing them. So again, back to our idea of flipping that pyramid on its head, we go straight to immunosuppressive drugs right away to avoid a hospitalization scenario. So, Let's take a quick break and we can come back and talk about that. Yeah, let's come back in five minutes. Okay, so severe disease is uh, is w what we're going to talk about. But again, this could be construed as if you have somebody who presents with Crohn's first time and it's a, a flare and you know, again, this could be something we start with. So that's what I'm trying to. I know this is confusing because I keep talking about it and then presenting it differently, but I just want to cover all my bases here because you're going to see this differently done in the community depending on what style your provider prefers. You might have somebody who prefers the old school step up or somebody who is really aggressive about starting somebody on um, immunomodulating therapy. So anyway, um, severe disease, usually uh, hospitalization, which is going to look at a couple of different things um, is going to hospitalize somebody. So we've talked about these already, but severe symptoms, which usually are going to be related to bleeding loss. Um, and then septic looking appearance. So toxic appearance is what, what I'm saying here, but usually sepsis. So you've got some sort of GI contents leaking into either uh, another organ, maybe um, if you think of like a bladder fistula potentially, you know, severe urosepsis picture is not, un not uncommon, um, or just a peritoneal cavity infection. Um, those can, can lead to septic uh, symptoms pretty quickly. Um, therapy would be, first of all, we want to make sure if the patient is septic, we're going to treat them like any septic patient. So aggressive antibiotic therapy, very broad spectrum. You don't necessarily know what's in the GI tract. You certainly want to cover anaerobes and gram negatives. Usually people are going to get MRSA coverage. They're probably going to be covered for pseudomonas as well. Or just go throw the kitchen sink at them and see what happens. Um, and a lot of times IV steroids on top of that, and that's to help with the flare of the immune disease. <laughs> Suppress the immune system a bit. Um, and it sounds a little counterintuitive because your immune system can help with some of the um, some of the infectious parameters, but in this particular case, the disease needs to be controlled on the same, at the same time as we're trying to control the, uh, the infection. So in that case, both of those are fine. If it's just severe symptoms without a septic picture, then you would avoid um, the aggressive antibiotics. So again, if there's no evidence of fevers or high white count or any type of suspicion of infection, you would just do high IV dose steroids for those patients who are having uh, just a severe flare. Um, once stabilized, you want to focus on transitioning to an outpatient friendly regimen, which we kind of talked about already. So um, the question is, what about people who are uh, severe, refractory, and then where do we go based on um, the more advanced tiers in the pyramid? So um, people who have severe refractory disease is defined as repeated relapse after receiving remission with first-line agents. So if you've tried some of those drugs we just talked about historically um, and just not working for you, that's considered a relapse. And at that point, you need to consider <coughs> what you're doing is effective for the patient. Is there some other reason why they relapse? Or do you go to a more severe uh, or more, um, I say, escalated treatment strategy? So anyway, immunomodulators and biologics are two drugs. So it's kind of this is going to sound like a combination between um, transplant medicine and rheumatoid arthritis. So drugs that have been studied for Crohn's orally, um, azathioprine was historically one of the medications that was used. Remember, this is an older anti-rejection medication, anti-metabolite. 
not really useful anymore. We just have better drugs out there. So theoretically, you could see a patient on this. If you have an old, probably an older Crohn's patient who's been stable on it for a while, that wouldn't be totally uncommon to see it. But probably not going to start a whole lot of patients on this right off the bat. Um, methotrexate is another uh, another indication um, with Crohn's for methotrexate here. And it's very similar to how we'd use it for RA. And um, historically, they were using azathioprine as first line or intolerance to it. But methotrexate could be a continued or considered a first line therapy. Um, and it's 25 milligrams per week, usually give it IM. Um, sometimes they will do like a three month response to methotrexate to see how it's going. And if things are going well, they'll switch you to a weekly PO regimen. But usually it's always IM. I think the idea is that the absorption's better um, that way, and you're for sure, especially with Crohn's, you know, you never know. Well, you, you can look at imaging and stuff, but who knows what type of absorption is getting affected by the Crohn's flares. So if you can't rely on the GI tract to, to absorb your medications and process them properly, IM is going to make more sense in a patient like this, where for RA, it's not really a concern we have. Uh, and then we talked about folic acid. It's an antifolate metabolite, so you do. Um, uh, supplement that appropriately for those patients so they don't get deficient in folic acid. Uh, yeah? Um, with that, is this for acute deficient deficient disease? Would that be like going to the sequence or the yeah, there's been some, uh, so yeah, I did skip over that. Um, there's been some evidence of, I'll go back inside here. So about the acute active fistulous disease, there's been some evidence with azathioprine that shows if you do have an active fistula, it is an effective uh, therapy. Now the question is, is it more effective than other things that haven't really been studied there? I don't know for sure, but there is some use there potentially. Um, I don't know if it's something that would catapult it to something you'd actually want to use over like methotrexate or something else, but I think acutely it can work a little bit faster than methotrexate, which can take a few weeks to really get full effect. So you might see that done in some cases. Like if you have an active fistula, a severe flare going on, steroids might not be totally cutting it, um, azathioprine might be added on to those patients. But it would be a, an, odd, an odd clinical picture, I think, but it is something to, to consider. Okay, biologics. So the, the thing we've all been waiting for, infliximab or Remicade was the first uh, <laughs> drug that was developed for this. Um, we talked about it with RA, but it's the IV one. So this is one that people aren't going to do at home. This is something they have to come in and get an infusion for. It's every eight weeks. So um, not, it's not like they're coming in regularly for this. So it's not terribly inconvenient, but still, you know, you have to go sit in an infusion center a couple times a year. Um, it does have the most evidence, and again, it's been around the longest and um, used the most frequently for Crohn's. So it was one of the first ones studied in Crohn's specifically and developed for Crohn's patients. Um, which is why it's got a lot of good evidence behind it. But just like any tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitor, uh, they all probably work for similar things. The one you won't see on here is Enbrel. Enbrel hasn't been studied in Crohn's disease, so for some reason it's not used. Now, why exactly? I'm not sure, but it's just not. So really what you're going to be looking at is somebody's either going to be on IV uh, uh, infliximab or they're going to be using the sub-Q adalimumab or Humira. And so that's a uh, sub-Q shot every two weeks, just as a reminder. Um, sertolizumab or Simzia is um, a newer drug that is a sub Q injection every four weeks, and it's similar to the other ones. I'm going to show you uh, some combination stuff here and where that might be used in a second, but it is a TNF agent as well. It's just a newer one that's out. And I believe it was studied in combination with methotrexate, but I don't want to get ahead of myself here because I might have that on the next slide. But anyway, so when, when it comes to these anti TNF agents, um, some it's not uncommon in Crohn's <coughs> or any. Uh, immune disease, autoimmune disease, for a patient to respond well to one and not to another. So if you fail one, try the other one, or try one of the other two, I should say. Uh, patients without active inflammation will likely not benefit from these therapies. So for um, it's just think about the way Crohn's is. So the, the idea is, is that you have to have some sort of active inflammation to actually have flares going on and complications of the illness. So likely for people with even moderate Crohn's, they're going to have some inflammatory component to it. But if somebody has really mild Crohn's without any direct evidence of inflammation or very few flares, these drugs probably won't be all that useful. So that's where, again, we get a little bit confused, or I get myself confused and probably confuse you guys too, about where do you go? Do you start aggressive? And I think it's just what, how's the patient respond? 
how's the patient responding to the disease initially? Are they having severe inflammation, uh, it's causing severe symptoms, or moderate symptoms even. Um, for mild patients with, with minimal symptoms related to uh, diarrhea or bleeding or fistulas or anything like that, um, probably not going to be all that effective with these. And these are, of course, expensive. So we do want to use them appropriately. But the majority of Crohn's patients will probably fall under the realm of being appropriate candidates for this. So I don't want to, I don't want you to read too much into that bullet point. Just think about it as, as uh is the whole spectrum of the disease. Most of them are going to have some inflammatory component. Um, all these agents have been studied. Likely no major difference between the three. So again, infliximab has the most evidence behind it. But the other ones have shown to be very, very good uh, therapies as well and not really any inferior to infliximab. Um, sertralizumab, being the newer one, has been shown to maybe be slightly less effective than the other two. So, But is it still useful? I think so. Um, responsible alternative to immunomodulators, so compared to your azathioprine and methotrexate, which have side effects with them, these don't have really a lot of side effects. So you can remember when you talk about biologic drugs, there's a higher risk for immunogenicity, so reacting to the uh, product itself and having some sort of anaphylactic response. Um, but other than that, uh, you have a slight increased risk for some latent infections like TB and hepatitis, so you get tested for that. Maybe some uh, evidence for increased things like respiratory infections, like uh, you know rhinoviruses and things like that. But overall, not a huge difference to the general population, which is pretty impressive considering you're affecting the immune system in a pretty substantial way. So again, much better tolerated than methotrexate and azathioprine across the board. There's no debate there, um, and likely more effective overall. Increased cancer risk is with a question mark. Uh, there is a theory that you can have some. Uh, that these drugs might be associated with um, an increased risk in, in cancer generally due to the way that they're modulating the TNF or interacting with the TNF uh, factor. And the thing is, is that there's something that um, that's thought to be tumor related when it comes to tumor necrosis factor. So inhibiting it does it have some impact on tumors potentially? Again, it's theoretical. So don't want to get too much into it. It's not a, a firm. Um, uh, uh, side effect or country or anything like that. It's just something that's theoretical. Might see more evidence for research on it in the future. Um, some other therapies. So some interesting new stuff with Crohn's. You have the traditional, and traditional is becoming, the TNF agents have been around now, but they're kind of becoming traditional for Crohn's. So that's the standard. Now what we're looking at is maybe some more interesting therapies. So <clears throat> mycophenolate or Celsep, again, another anti-rejection medication, um, has been shown to actually be pretty good for Crohn's. However, um, while it was initially effective for patients, they see a lot of relapse after a year or two of taking it. And um, it's not as maybe an azathioprine alternative, just like we would use it for transplant medicine. Um, so it had a lot of promise right away. And initially, it might be a decent drug to help control a flare for a patient that could maybe otherwise afford other medications. So there is an option there to use it alternatively to azathioprine potentially. But at the same time, a uh, long term strategy not going to be effective uh, for. Uh, management. Some other uh, options that have come out, you have a, a couple drugs. So natalizumab or tisabri, which is a multiple sclerosis drug, uh, has been shown promise in Crohn's disease. Uh, uh, Ustekinumab, which is uh, Stolera, has been shown to have some. And then um, Antibio or Velozumab is a recently approved one for Crohn's and um, ulcerative colitis. So we've talked about uh, a couple of these. Tisabri, I wouldn't I don't think you're going to see a lot of that use in Crohn's. It's a really expensive MS drug, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. Um, but um, this new drug has a novel mechanism of action. It's integrin receptor antagonist, which um, how it modulates the immune system, I'm not entirely sure. It's a newer drug, so I don't know a ton about it. Um, but get another tool in the wheelhouse for Crohn's management. And the question is that it's going to come up is, can you combine some of this stuff? So if you have somebody on a TNF inhibitor, would it work to add on one of these? It's very possible you could see somebody on multiple biologics at some point for advanced disease. So is that approved at this point? No, I'm just speculating now. But um, the nice thing is, is that we have options to work with, which you know, 10 years ago we didn't really have much. So it's it's cool to see these disease progress, or the, not the disease progress, but the um, treatments progress and hopefully give people better control of their life and better quality of life. Because Crohn's going to be a really, really debilitating disease quality of life wise, not just due to all the complications with it. So I'm um, just like with any disease, but I'm all in favor of having some more drugs, even if they are quite well studied at this point. I think they're, we're seeing some more promise in the biological arena. Um, 
And that's where Crohn's and any autoimmune diseases we're going to see advances. It's all going to be <coughs> We're not going to see a lot of small molecule advances when it comes to this. You might see some um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor type drugs come out here or there, but it's really going to be immune system targeted and it's going to be biologic related for the most part. And then you have surgery. So surgery can be a really good option for a Crohn's patient. Some bowel resection and colectomies have been done for people with really uh, advanced large bowel um, involvement. Uh, I had a pharmacy uh, colleague who, who was a couple years ahead of me in school who had really nasty Crohn's. And then, you know, one week he just had just off the charts flares. He was out of school for a while. He ended up with a colectomy and was like, it's the best decision I've ever made. So he had surgery. It's problematic, but compared to the disease, it just shows you like this. It's not. Obviously, there's lots of diseases that aren't pleasant, but this one has a pretty big impact on, on somebody's day-to-day -day life. So. All right, so management of iliocolonic Crohn's disease. This talks about looking at mild versus moderate to severe, and so um, treating in some of these different... Oh, this is... Uh, sorry, I forgot why I put this on here. Um, this is just for the record to show that kids who have Crohn's, you treat it very simply. And that's the only reason I put this up here. In case you're curious about how you treat peds, because you can see Crohn's in peds patients. Um, it's very, very similar um, how we're going to treat it to adults patients. And, and, and bioallergics are getting more use in peds autoimmune diseases as well. So anyway, I'm not going to test you on peds or anything. It's just for your reference here. All right, ulcerative colitis. We've basically already talked about all the drugs and talked about this a lot. I'd like to think of UC as kind of a Crohn's disease light in the sense that you can have really bad symptoms that are similar, so it can be as debilitating as Crohn's. You just don't have the same um, breadth of involvement possibilities, and you usually don't see as much fistulation with UC, although it certainly is possible. Um, disease severity is similar, looking at bloody stools uh, and weight loss and diarrhea type of uh, symptoms and presentation. Um, because the 5-ASA drugs work well in the colon, they do take a bit of more of a front line here. We can actually use a couple different presentations of them. So um, <clears throat> suppositories and enemas are generally not useful in Crohn's disease, but in ulcerative colitis, uh, especially if it's towards the distal end of the colon, you can get um, a suppository enema to the site of action. And so you have some foaming enemas and different foaming um, suppositories and uh, uh, products that are steroid-related too. So hydrocortisone comes with some products that work that way. So anyway, you can you can do a strategy where you give somebody a oral 5-ASA drug and also a rectal 5-ASA drug, and um, hopefully you're covering both uh, ends of the colon at that point, and you can get a better breadth of coverage and hopefully better symptom control that way. Uh, maintenance of remission. So usually if you can get somebody into remission using some of these uh, medications, you're looking at one relapse per year, and then a lot of times people might just use a suppository or an enema once daily, once daily at that time. Remember, this is for proctitis or proctosigmoiditis, <coughs> so it's, again, the distal side we're talking about here. Uh, multiple relapses, if somebody does have not doing quite as well as we want them to on a rectal formulation, oral formulations are usually slightly more effective for that. Um, Left-sided extensive or pancolitis, we're usually going to do oral, but again, you can combine the rectals with these as well. So there's no reason why you can't do both, and again, a patient might benefit from the combination there. Rectal formulations generally we tend to shy away from just because they aren't ideal for patients to give, but they can be effective for this particular disease. Um, oral glucocorticoids can help too for, for more severe flares, and um, that's going to be a common thing you see uh, done for a, a, a UC flare. Okay, so initial treatment for uh, severe ulcerative colitis, you're usually going to start somebody on oral glucocorticoids plus high-dose um, 5-ASA drugs plus potentially topicals. I think you put topicals in parentheses there. Not necessary in all cases, but it's certainly something to consider. Um, if somebody has severe UC and they present with systemic toxicity, again, looking septic, you treat it very similar to Crohn's with antibiotics. Um, limited response from those options, you're going to look at IV fluids, IV glucocorticoids, uh, and then uh, multiple relapses, you're looking at azathioprine or a biologic therapy too. So again, once you work your way up the ladder, it's very similar to Crohn's, you're going to be treating it um, with the same drug. So the TNF agents are going to apply to UC as well. Just slightly different disease, usually a lot less severe um, in symptoms than Crohn's, but certainly can be debilitating for patients as well. I have a question. Yeah. Are these ulcerative colitis cells 
on these meds chronically to stay in remission, or they just go to remission and off? Usually they're on something, so it's either an oral uh, 5-ASA drug is usually enough to keep people in remission, or uh, rectal administration okay. once daily, once they're in control. Yep. Um, fulminant colitis. So this is really severe um, UC with uh, <laughs> school per day, lots of bleeding, distension, looking at likely septic picture. And again, hospital, broad spectrum antibiotics, IV fluids, IV steroids. Um, no response after that. <clears throat> after three days, you're looking at kind of throwing the kitchen sink at the person because if you get to four to seven days without response, you can get this toxic megacolon syndrome, um, and that can be severely um, problematic, mostly from a sepsis point of view. It's very difficult to control that if you aren't removing the source of infection. So ultimately, what we're trying to do with really severe fulminant colitis is treat somebody aggressively so that we don't have to do a colectomy. But ultimately, that's kind of the end option you would have. All right, IBS, just a couple quick slides on IBS. IBS is not, uh, not similar. It's not generally thought of as like UC or Crohn's or kind of in a different subgroup. So IBS can be very different for different people. And I just want to mention it really briefly because it's usually associated with abdominal pain or discomfort. It's something you might see a lot of patients present with uh, kind of an idiopathic abdominal pain, they don't really have anything that is a cue as far as like what's triggering it or why they have it. Um, in severe cases, you can see rectal bleeding and weight loss and anemia. Um, that can be signs of more severe disease, but those would be the things we look at uh, trying to avoid. Um, so the question is, what do you treat? Usually there's no pharmacotherapy for mild IBS. You're usually looking at diet, excuse me, dietary and lifestyle modifications. Um, failure to respond to lifestyle are a lot of the, the bowel medications we talked about today. So bulk forming products, um, fiber supplements, Miralax can help too. Um, some of the more advanced uh, anti, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, like lubiprostone or linoclotide um, can help as well. So there's a couple different options there. Um, and then as far as abdominal pain goes, there is a drug that I haven't talked about yet, I don't think. I might have mentioned it briefly, but I don't remember. But anyway, it's an antispasmodic drug that's got some heavy anticholinergic properties. It's called dicyclamine or bentyl. Um, and uh, this is one that I see our ED and urgent care providers use a fair amount because they'll get patients in with really vague symptoms that don't really match any particular disease, but they're abdominal related. They'll try a dose of this and, and it works. The patient gets symptomatic relief, so they'll <laughs> give them a short course and have a follow up with a GI specialist to refer their workup. But, um, I don't know if it's something people generally take long term. I think it might be just for ideally for symptomatic relief, uh, but certainly um, it seems to be an effective uh, mitigation of some of the more severe symptoms with IBS. Um, persistent abdominal pain despite use of antispasmodics. You can have um, antidepressants uh, actually have shown to be effective for irritable bowel syndrome. So there's a couple different ones. Um, and we'll talk about the, the specific antidepressants during that lecture, but there is some evidence that shows that they work. If diarrhea is really a prominent symptom, um, loperamide or um, bile acid sequestrants, which uh, have originally were useful for cholesterol treatment. We'll talk about those very briefly um, during the cholesterol lecture coming up in a, in a couple weeks here. Um, but uh, we usually don't use antibiotics for IBS people. They're just not indicated. There's no um, infectious pathogen usually causing the symptoms. So unless we have a really good reason or they're having some enteric pathogen that's the cause and you can identify that in a stool culture, um, antibiotics aren't going to be useful for the average um, IBS patient. All right. Any questions on Crohn's, UC? Yeah. What do you recommend versus the stuff out there the top one? Uh, yeah, like on the test, on the test I'd be pretty clear what I would give you. So I would say, I can't remember, I can look at the terminology I use and get back to you, but I believe I say, you know, if you're if you're approaching this from, uh, you don't want to use biologics or something, I'll give you like a, a pretty big hint on how I want you to approach it. Um, so, yeah. I'm not going to expect you to really base it off a lot of diagnostic criteria, but I might want you to know that, like, for example, 5-ASA drugs work in the colon and don't really work other places. So that might lead you to a decision. So, yeah.